Okay, today I'm going to show you how to photograph something, import that into FreeCAD, base a sketch on it, and eventually 3D print yourself a replacement part. Now clearly I've done this already, because I have the part right here, but there's a few things with it I need to tweak. And as long as I'm redoing it, I thought I may as well shoot a video and show you how. Because there's not that much content here on YouTube about how to base CAD objects off photographs, especially not with FreeCAD. I've seen a few uh, using Fusion 360, but that's an entirely different program, and I personally prefer using FreeCAD for a number of reasons. Uh, you know, open source has APIs, stuff I've talked about before. But uh, anyway, as far as FreeCAD goes, I've only seen one of the video demoing this. Uh, that was from a guy named Subtonic, who I've mentioned before, because he's one of the uh, primary authors of the uh, Pathwork Bench in FreeCAD, the thing you use to make G-code. And uh, I'll link his video below. I, I definitely would encourage you to watch it. Uh, you know, subscribe to his channel, buy his book, all that jazz, because he's done some good work and it's definitely worth checking out. Um, but the video he did demoing how to work off of an image used a rather simple and straightforward part. You know, it was a rather easy one. There weren't any hurdles to overcome when building it out. Uh, and he also assumes that you know what you're doing when you're using FreeCAD. <laughs> so for contrast, <coughs> excuse me, I'm getting over a cold. Uh, it, for contrast, I'm going to do a more complicated part with a whole bunch of curves, uh, a couple of holes, a few different heights for the extrusion, just things that make it harder. And I'm going to do it from the point of view of somebody who doesn't really know what he's doing and is just blundering his way through the FreeCAD GUI. Because uh, <laughs> that's where I am. You know, I'm, uh, I'm not a uh, mechanical engineer. I do this as a hobby, kind of for fun. So I can guarantee you I'm going to be doing some things wrong here. Okay, just keep that in mind. But while I'm doing them wrong, at least I'm getting them done. And that's the important part. And I figured it might be helpful for some other novice to see how a novice like me, you know, gets these kind of things done and maybe just generally help get you acquainted with FreeCAD. And if you are an expert, you probably don't need this video, but if you want to watch it anyway and comment, let me know uh, how I can improve in the future. I would still appreciate that. Uh, both people are watching this later on so they can see, you know, how to do it better. And then for myself as well, so when I redo projects like this in the future, I myself can do it better. Now, what is this project? Well, this is the rear derailleur hanger from one of my bikes. Basically, this blob here uh, goes on the rear dropout right by the cassette, and that is what your derailleur hangs on, right? Derailleur hanger, derailleur hangs on it. And the idea is this is a um, weak and fragile part of the bike intentionally. So if you slip up and you have a fall on the drivetrain side of your bike, this will take the brunt of the impact and be a sacrificial part to spare the frame and the derailleur from getting you know, buggered because those would be more expensive repairs. Whereas this here, you can replace for 25 bucks, at least in theory anyway. So me being the klutz that I am with you know, no gymnastic ability, uh, happened to have <coughs> a slip up a, a few months ago. And I didn't break this guy, but I did bend it. And I tried to find a replacement, but I couldn't get one because this bike here is so old. It's like 25 years old, made in the, the 90s sometime. And these derailleur hangers are specific to each frame. So this being out of production, I couldn't get one of these either. And I did the hack fix of simply bending it back. So it wasn't snapped, it was just bent, bent it back. Now, if you've worked with aluminum, you know that aluminum doesn't like being worked. Right? When you bend it, uh, it gets weaker and eventually it fails. So you can see, uh, focus it, there we go. That little uh, crack right there by the hole is where it just suddenly failed one day, sending my rear derailleur from fourth gear into the spokes. Fun. <laughs> and really, it's not that surprising it broke right there because you can just see how, how thin that is. It's you know, 3.5 millimeters thick, uh, you know, not very wide across, got a three millimeter hole in it with a counter bore. That, that is exactly where I would expect it to fail if it were. Um, you know, for example, uh, another rear derailleur is on this bike here, which is still, you know, in good nick. Uh, you can see how much thicker, you know, how much wider this one is. And it's designed a bit better too, in that the counter bores are on the back of the dropout and they come through to a threaded hole on the hanger. Whereas this hanger itself is in this counter board and the dropout is threaded. So this is just... <laughs> A very, very fragile part. It could have been a bit beefier than this. Um, this is kind of what happens, right? Now, will I think that the 3D printed one will be strong enough to hold up to the 
the load that it takes there, just acting as a counter to the spring of the derailleur? Probably not, honestly. Um, I know from printing this here that it already has a little bit of flex to it. And uh, coincidentally, one of the other videos I saw of someone building something uh, off of a photo in Fusion was uh, a mountain biker printing his own rear derailleur. <laughs> and he got it to work eventually, but only by beefing the thing up pretty significantly in ways I don't think I can just because the geometry of the dropout here. But uh, you know, while this probably isn't gonna work, I figured it's still you know good practice with CAD, uh, if you need to do an example, you know, just something for fun anyway. And <coughs> maybe at some point too, that'll give me a you know reason to get a CNC mill, and I can make a, make an aluminum one of these, you know, that way. Uh, you know, at some point far down the line, once I finish the freaking plat, anyway, <laughs> maybe at some point. Or if anyone watching here happens to have a uh, you know aluminum router mill and wants to do me a solid, uh, hit me up below. <laughs> uh, but you know honestly, it'll probably just be practice, and uh, when it doesn't work, I'll have an excuse to get another bike, as if I even need an excuse. So I mentioned this guy needing a couple tweaks. You know, what exactly is wrong? Because it looks pretty close, and it is. But if you look very closely, you'll see. This plastic one is a little bit big. Like this one hole here is definitely undersized, but that part was intentional to give me room to eventually uh, drill and tap that hole. But everything else is maybe five or 10% bigger, just barely. So when it goes on the dropout over here, get this little gap. And with that gap, it's not gonna be able to transfer the load against the, uh, the dropout well enough, and this will bend even more and probably break her off the hop. So, <coughs> excuse me, I'm gonna redo this, especially because I think I know what the problem is. And so that this guy here has no flat surface to get a reference measurement on, right? There's nothing straight to put some calipers on and say like, oh, this is exactly, you know, half an inch or 50 millimeters or whatever. You, you can't, can't do that on something weird like this. So what I did to get my reference size was I dropped it on some grid paper, took a photo of it, and then based it on the size of the grid. The thing is, the grid is beneath the hanger, right? So when you take the photo, this top surface here is seven millimeters closer to the camera and appears a little bit bigger in the photo. So when you import that into FreeCAD, you're basing all your sketch stuff off a little bit bigger image than you mean to, and your whole thing turns out five or 10% bigger. So what I'm gonna do this time is I got this ruler set up at the exact same height as the top of the hanger. And I'm gonna use this for my reference uh, your measurement for scaling the image, and that way all the features turn out the, the, the correct size. But uh, I'm still gonna use the grid paper here to help me keep the camera straight on. Because if I took the, cam the photo right now, with the uh, camera at this angle here, the whole thing would end up kind of squished in this direction, right? Your perspective is wrong. So you wanna take the photo from directly above. With the grid paper, you can, uh, then go into your camera app on your phone and pretty much any camera app should have the ability to turn on a grid, like a three by three or a four by four, something you can use to help aim the camera. So you turn the grid on, you line up the, uh, the grid on the paper, the grid on your screen, and then you take your photo. And that way it ends up straight on. You know, there's stuff you can do in software to uh, fix perspective on photos. Like you've probably seen that in your, uh, your online banking app. When you go to deposit a check online, you take a photo of it, and it somehow takes that really sideways photo of yours and then squares it out to, uh, to get the check image and scan it into your, your uh, online banking account. <coughs> but with the grid paper, you can skip having to do that you know, second pr uh, perspective fix and just use the photo as it is. So you wanna get straight up above it, line things up, and take your photo in the middle of your screen as well. Because if you take it with your object off to the side, Again, there's distortion around the edges of what your camera has. Just because a camera is taking a 3D surface and projecting it onto a 2D image. So you want your thing to take maybe the middle you know, section of a 3x3 grid, roughly. Anyway, I'm going to take this photo and then we'll pick up again in FreeCAD. Okay, so this is FreeCAD, at least with any luck, uh, this is FreeCAD. I'm uh, using slightly different software this time to do my screencast, what I'd used before. 
And of course, I run a very niche Linux distro. So every time I want to install new software, it requires a whole bunch of headbanging and debugging to make it work. But I think it is up and running now. And as an added bonus this time, up here in the upper right-hand corner, I've got a little thing that will show you all of my keystrokes. So that way you can follow along a bit better as working in the CAD. I know that is kind of a, a small font there, but you know, I wrote it in 34 lines of Python. So for that much, it's not that bad, right? Um, and it just kind of helps you keep track of what here's going on. Because if you don't see the keys and the clicks and stuff, it can be kind of hard to follow some of these things. I know from watching plenty of screencasts myself. Uh, anyway, this is FreeCAD uh, 0.18. If you're on an older version of FreeCAD, I would strongly encourage you to update. Uh, 0.17, it would be a good idea. 0.16, you basically need to update. Uh, these guys have been doing a lot of improvements in the past few years, and like 0.16 is so far behind, it's not even funny. Um, and 0.17 is still pretty far behind. If you want to be like super, you know, edgy and stuff, you can also go and get the absolutely just code from the repository because again, FreeCAD is open source free software. Um, but you know, for most people, the most stable release 0.18 should be just fine. And if you're watching this video, you know, a year, <coughs> two or three after I publish it, well, just before war and some things here might not be the same as what you're using now. Um, let's see. Also, this does run on uh, Windows, Mac, and Linux, all three program, all three platforms, but the method of installation varies from platform to platform. And I'll say if you're on Linux, do be sure uh, when you install this from your package manager that you get version 0.18 because some package managers like in Debian or whatever are pretty bad about making sure the uh, software in their package repository matches the latest version of the software available. So again, just, you know, Find your own tutorial for installing this thing and make sure you're you know, following along on 0.18 or something newer. Now, as far as the workbenches we're going to be using goes, uh, we're going to be primarily in the image, uh, sketcher, and part design workbenches. Now you might see part design and part and a sketcher and drawing and be like, what, here's the difference. You know, a sketch is a drawing and a part design and a part are the same thing too. So what's the, what's the deal? Well, as I understand it, the sketcher is for <coughs> uh, the sketcher is for drawing 2D images with uh, constraints. Things like uh, this line and this line have to be in equal length and they must be this far apart and then this circle must be tangent to this line and this angle must bisect this angle and those sort of things. And from there you build up uh, 3D parts in part design and you can draw additional sketches on the faces of those parts. So you go back and forth between sketcher and part design to successfully build up uh, the object you want to design. Now the part workbench is for making uh, 3D primitives like spheres and cylinders and cubes and those things you might combine using stuff like um, like boolean operations and, and those sort of things. But the sketcher and part design workbenches are primarily what you're going to be using for making complex three-dimensional things. And the drawing one over here is similar to Sketcher, but it's primarily for when you want to do something in 2D and then leave it in 2D, like a schematic or a blueprint or something like that. And it doesn't have the same features for building up 3D components out of stuff you do in drawings. And it's also more um, oriented towards like measurements and things and less towards constraints. Again, uh, I'm not a free cat expert, but that, that's my at least novice understanding of what's what. Now, because we're working with an image today, we're gonna to start off in the image workbench. And we're gonna to wanna to load the image of the derailleur hanger we just took. And I just realized that there's some points of this video I'm gonna to have to crop out. Because when I go to open up a file, uh, that will show you my username, which is part of my real name, which I don't want on the internet right now. Because the internet is full of crazy people. Um, <laughs> So, uh, you know, all I did here was open up and select that one image we just took. Um, and then here and there, I'll just be, you know, cropping out things to try not dox myself too early on. Uh, now, anyway, uh, we're going to put this in the XY plane. And here we go. It's a derailleur hanger. Now, this is a cropped image of the photo. So I already took the photo and I trimmed it down a bit just to make sure I don't have so much stuff around it to work with. Um, when you take that photo, you want to have your object be in the middle of 
uh, your camera view and then not taking up the whole camera view. Because again, around the edge of what the lens is seeing, you're gonna have more lens distortion. So uh, the image is to be you know, bigger than what I can even show on the screen. And this is just a fraction of it. But it's a fraction that we're really you know, interested in working with. Now, uh, that image is a bunch of pixels, right? And it has no, um, no information to tell you how big anything in that image is, apart from the fact that we took a photo of a ruler here. So we're gonna use this ruler that we included to scale uh, our image and tell FreeCAD how big things in this photo are. So here's a scaling tool, and you'll see it just popped up a funny window because again, I'm on a weird Linux distro that doesn't have a desktop and pop-up windows kind of do that to me. But uh, we're gonna select from the end of the seven to the end of the five, and that's two inches. Now I've already set FreeCAD to work in millimeters for this project because the derailleur hanger is uh, mostly measured in millimeter units, like it's seven millimeters thick, etc. Um, but regardless of whether you're in inches or millimeters, this tool over here uh, does take the distance in millimeters. So we're gonna say that 50, or the two inch line we just drew is 50.8 millimeters. And then, okay, oh, and I guess like the image we're trying to scale. This guy here, and then come back, and then okay. And now FreeCAD knows uh, how big something in this image is supposed to be in real units. Now, last time I did this, I drew my line on the grid down here, right? And then told that like that was 50.8 millimeters on eight sections of this quarter inch grid spacing. But that made the whole thing turn out a bit too big because as you can kind of see here, uh, spazzy fingers of the touchpad, there we go. <laughs> um, this line here, that comes in just after the five. And then up here at the seven, this line comes in a good deal before the seven. And like part of that is the, the ruler isn't lined up with the grid perfectly. But then another part of it is that this ruler is at the height of the derailleur hanger. Cause I stacked this ruler up on a bunch of index cards to make it higher and give us a better measure of how big things on this surface are. Cause uh, last time when I measured it based on the grid beneath it, the grid is lower down to the camera. So it is effectively smaller looking than things up here. You know, as things get higher and closer to your camera lens, they're gonna appear bigger. And that ended up being enough to make a couple percentage points difference. But now I think we got the uh, image and that's what we needed up here. So we're gonna go on to making a sketch as we start a new sketch. So we're gonna drop this uh, in the XY plane and uh, get drawing. So our sketch is gonna consist mostly of a few circles for the three bolt holes you see, and also a whole bunch of splines for all these funny curves. Now I can make uh, my life easier by taking parts like from here to here, which is a fancy curve, and then approximating that as a simple straight line. I'm not gonna do that though, um, in part to stay you know, as true to shape as possible, just for the practice of doing so, and also because splines have a couple of finding your things you got to watch out for when you're trying to do a sketch and build that into a 3d part and it's a good demonstration of things you might encounter when um you're working with a sketcher and part design workbenches we're going to start off with the uh, circles down here because they're the absolute simplest part of the sketch and use them as our warm-up so we're going to select the circle tool and then draw a circle here and a circle here and the size and even the placement isn't terribly crucial right now. And you can see there that just uh, snapped to the grid because I have the grid snap and auto constraint both enabled right now. So I'm gonna turn both of them off. Uh, as an example of auto constraints, if I wanted to do a uh, line now, I just drew this line like that. See how it's showing the uh, little thing at the end of the tooltip that just disappeared, that little guy, the line and the curve, that specifies that this line here must be tangent to the circle. So if I want to go and move this thing now, no matter how I move it, it changes the circle and the line to make them tangent to each other. So those are kind of nifty, but uh, 
the auto constraints can be a pain in the butt too if you're not trying to do stuff like that, which I'm not right now, so I will turn that off. And now I wanna make these uh, two circles equal in size. So if I select them both with control and left click, right? Left click, control, left click. How handy is that? Um, and then come to, let's see, it's the equal. And then I'm gonna set one of them to be a three millimeter diameter, which is also a 1.5 millimeter radius. You can see they both shrink together. And then I'm gonna just line them up manually with what I see in the photo. And that's pretty much right on the money already. This hole's a bit distorted just because the, the part is already broken right here. But I think given the situation, that's about the best we get. Now moving up to the one up here, I'm gonna reactivate the circle tool, draw another circle. And this is a 10 millimeter by one millimeter pitch thread. It's a fine uh, metric pitch. <coughs> Fuck. But uh, we're gonna specify its radius, not as five millimeters, oh, fuck you, uh, but as, one second. <laughs> I just canceled that out by mistake, there we go. Trying to talk and work at the same time. Um, but we're gonna specify it as 4.5 instead. That way the hole we get is nine millimeters. Uh, that's both what you want if you're uh, tapping it with a mechanical tap, the way I'm planning to, you know, once I print it, I'll, um, I'll go to the local bike shop and borrow their fancy, you know, metric fine thread tap. I don't have it in my shop right now, but I'll borrow theirs and just tap the hole in that. Um, but even if you wanna uh, do these threads in FreeCAD directly, you wanna have um, that same style of uh, hole already in it. Hopping over this file for a minute, I have a uh, version of this thing, which is more or less complete, uh, even including the threads here, already tapped into the hole. And I've done these in FreeCAD, so say if you were to have a 3D printer and you wanted to try printing these threads off directly using a very fine layer height, you could try doing that. Personally, I'm not going to even bother. I just, I don't want to deal with uh, tweaking the settings and stuff to get it right. You know, it's easier just do it on a local bike shop and borrow the tap. But I can at least give you the gist of how these uh, threads work here in FreeCAD. Might not do it for you live, like the full blown thing, because it's kind of involved and it takes me a long time. But uh, the gist of it at least is you have a helix that you draw in the middle of your circle. And then you draw a, a thread form sketch perpendicular to that. And you sweep it out and then you cut that sweep from the rest of the body. <coughs> now the importance of the pilot hole uh, I found is that if you try, uh, let's see, if you try cutting out threads that come to a full sharp point at the end, then FreeCAD has tr had trouble for me generating those 3D shapes, which is, I guess, to say that the pilot hole uh, diameter must be greater than the root diameter of the thread you're trying to cut with this swept out helix. And, you know, uh, basically, uh, FreeCAD, you know, it's open source software. It's using uh, Open Cascade very heavily. That's the, the underlying CAD kernel that is dealing, uh, responsible for making all these 3D models. Um, and both those things are lit, written largely by volunteers, you know, for free. So there's some bugs and, you know, pain points I gotta work around uh, and that have gotten better over time. But Boolean cuts and fillets in particular are known to be some of the, you know, harder things to get right. So occasionally this stuff, you gotta make sure uh, you work carefully around to end up you know, with a, a good final product. So here uh, on this version, I made a, a hole that was basically the precise size that I could. If I zoom in really closely, you can kind of see there's just barely a little bit of a flat. Um, and that was necessary to make this helix cut, um, at least on version 0.18 with the way that I did it. Also in FreeCAD, there's probably a million different ways to make this thread form um, that may or may not have that problem. I'm just doing the one way that I know uh, how personally. But uh, yeah, you do wanna have this pilot hole, whether you're gonna be tapping it uh, mechanically or even in FreeCAD. But uh, with this circle roughly in place, we're gonna specify that. Oh, spazzy 
laptop trackpads. There we go, as 4.5, there. And then we're gonna resituate it. Oh, and now look at that. I went and they turned back on by uh, re-entering the edit sketch. There we go. Okay, so now the circles are in place and now we're on to splines. So now we have to draw a profile that we can extrude at three different heights, um, five, seven, and 3.5 millimeters. And those are all dimensions I took off of the part directly with some calipers. So we're gonna use the pad tool for that in the uh, part design workbench. And it has a couple of requirements you need to meet. Uh, the primary one is you gotta have a single outer um, continuous edge that you're trying to extrude. So um, basically you either have to have like one long ass polyline that you've just connected like dot to dot to dot all the way through to connect back on itself, which I probably wouldn't recommend, um, or a series of lines, arcs, splines, polylines, whatever, that eventually you know connect end to end and come back to themselves. And that's what we're gonna do. Um, you can have, uh, I guess they're called islands in the middle, things like this hole, like that's okay. And that will just extrude as a circular hole. If you have a square shape that extrude, extrude as a square hole, that's all fine. Um, what you can't have are things that intersect with the profile you're trying to uh, pad out. <coughs> so if I have the outer perimeter here, and then I also draw this little L shape there, that's no bueno. And that won't, uh, that won't pad then. It'll throw an error uh, saying that you have an invalid face, um, which is not the most useful error either. And <laughs> it took me a little while to figure it out, which is why I'm, why I'm bringing it up now, right? Um, but we need this line in order to know, you know, this is the section we're extruding at this height, and this is the section we're extruding at that height, and we want to differentiate those. Um, so my, my novice, not really free cat expert, kind of blundering way of getting around that uh, is to draw all these different segments and then to turn off select portions of them uh, with construction geometry and then do three separate padding operations to get uh, each component at the height you want it. Okay. <coughs> Whoa. Now, uh, another restriction, uh, since we're working with splines, is that they can only be connected um, at the ends. So if you have like a, let's see, you have like a, a line like this, that, one like this, and then you wanna have another line like that. You can then uh, hide them both and say that they must, uh, wait, no. It's like this point and this line must be coincident. There we go. And then no matter how I try to move this, it will only move along this line. Same thing with the, uh, the tangent circle I showed before, right, that thing. Um, with a spline, you can't do that in the middle. You can only connect them on the ends. So if you wanna have sections we can uh, mark as construction geometry for extruding the different height outer profiles, then we have to make sure we draw this as one and then this as one, right? And that way, uh, this line here becomes something we can turn off um, in a selective manner for when we're extruding the part that includes this little fin, and then the last part at the very top, which does not include the little fin, okay? So I'm gonna try and at least demonstrate these parts, and then I'm gonna go and do, let's see, oh my God, oh, spazzy ass laptop touchpad. Okay, it's usually nice having a sensitive touchpad for like general work, but the moment you go into a CAD program, it just becomes an absolute mess. Oh, oh, if only, yeah, anyway. <laughs> so we're gonna have one, for here, and then one for here. Uh, another one that goes from this point here, let's see, all the way down to this little bit. This L will be its own, so again, we can turn that off selectively. And then as well, the uh, little monkey tail bit here. And then this will be one as well. So we're gonna start off up here, and then I'll probably do the rest of those uh, off camera just because it'll take me way too long to do. And I don't want to put you all through that misery because you can see how skilled I am with graphical interfaces like this. 
<laughs> so, uh, what exactly is a spline? Um, I guess the mathematical definition is uh, it is the sexiest line you can get for a given set of points. <laughs> yeah, at some point I knew the, uh, the real definition, but uh, that was back when I did my uh, math degree. And, you know, that was a couple years ago, and once you learn to code, no one cares about your math knowledge. And then, after a few years of not using it, it goes out the window. So, yeah, paid a couple, I don't know, tens of thousands of dollars for that, and look how, you know, what it to me. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so, basically you draw a series of points, and uh, all the dots you draw end up being your uh, control points that you can then grab and then drag around, and then that manipulates your curve. And uh, probably by default, when you do this, uh, you'll have all these options. Right. Turn it on. Is that? That's strange. Usually there's a little thing here. Uh, not sure what exactly I'm doing. There's a, a thing here that shows you know how far you warp stuff by moving one individual point or the other. But I turned it off before, and it seems to not be turning it on again. Well, I'm going to just ignore that and move on anyway, because uh, I got stuff to do. But you can see how you can you know grab each individual point, um, and the diameters of these circles around the points uh, are indicative of the amount of weight you've put on that point. And they're just relative things. You can see by default they all have equality ratios on them. So if I wanted to make one point uh, have a higher relative weight and you know kind of warp the line more towards that point, I could turn off uh, these equality constraints and then change the diameter of one of those circles. But really, <coughs> those are just um, kind of symbolic things as are the points themselves and the, the spline itself is the curve uh, shown here. So we're gonna have the one point end right there and the other one end right there. And that way we can later connect uh, these things up and then turn off this whole section um, selectively. So now we're gonna draw the top part for this fin. Oh. Square my view back up, there we go. Back to the polylon tool. And I'd already turned off auto constraints earlier. And personally, I think that's a little bit better for this. Oh my God, spazzy, there we go. <laughs> For this work right now, um, because if you're relying on the auto constraints, you may or may not actually get it. Like if you click wrong, you might think you clicked it right. Uh, when I did this before, I had thought I clicked the thing, and it ended up being that I was just barely off, and I spent like 20 minutes trying to find the lines that had not connected correctly. So if you simply don't rely on that, then it forces you to do it manually and ensure that you got them right. So after I Get this all the way down to here. And then right click to finish, good. Now I can select this point. Actually, I wanna select this point first and then this point. So when I hit the uh, coincident constraint, it'll drag that point to there, see? And then spazzy mouse, there we go. Spazzy mouse, good. It's like this, it's like this. Set that to coincident, and that pulls it in. And then I can come back and start dragging these things around. Yeah, those look pretty good already. I'm pretty happy with that as it is. Maybe that one can be a little bit closer in. There we go. You kind of see how that works now. Um, let's see. And I guess it's also worth saying, uh, yeah, as we do this a whole bunch of splines, we're going to get basically a billion different degrees of freedom in our sketch um, that are going to be under constrained. And that's not ideal, but it's okay. Um, at least for doing a little one-off thing like this. So basically the idea of constraints is, so you have, you know, like this, right? So all these lines are... Um, already constrained to be either perpendicular or horizontal. But overall, the sketch still has some degrees of freedom, right? It can move in two different ways. 
either by changing width or by changing height. Um, so if we were to give it a, uh, let's see, a measurement constraint being like, This and being like, it says five millimeters. There we go. Now that's constrained. Um, now we've constrained this as well to be seven millimeters. Then it'd be stuck as a rectangle and you can move it around, but not, not change its scale at all, right? Because even now we can still uh, at least make it taller or wider. Yeah, we can't make it taller and shorter. We can make it wider and we can move it around. Um, now, if I were to add a constraint on this line here, so this is currently still, it's under constrained. If I were to add another constraint on here, like this, and say this one is two millimeters, see, this would be a bad constraint because you can't solve this being five and this being two, and these two being parallel and these two being parallel. It's simply not possible. So that's over constrained, which is no bueno. <coughs> Having it be under constrained like this is also not ideal because it means there's a lot of ways your sketch can still be moved and warped around. But for a thing like this, which is a whole bunch of curves, uh, that's kind of okay. And that's the best way I can describe it. Um, if you want a better explanation, talk to an expert. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'll catch you back in like 20 minutes to figure all this shit out. And there we have it with uh, one, two, three, four, five, six uh, splines giving us all the edges we need to make our part. And that only took 15 minutes to finish. You know, make all the points and drag them around until I was happy. Not that bad. Um, See, so now we have uh, 174 points just floating around willy-nilly, which I'm sure is a, uh, a number that would make any real CAD jockey just shake his head. But, you know, again, I'm a software developer, not an uh, engineer. So my job pays me to learn to code, not learn to CAD. And this is good enough for me. Uh, let's see. For other stuff, uh, here's the spline thing I mentioned before with uh, instant rave party. And uh, these lines here kind of show you how much you distorted your, your uh, curve by moving the uh, control points. I'm not exactly sure why they didn't show up before, but I, I prefer to leave them off anyway, just because it gets kind of noisy otherwise. Um, see, and then as far as other stuff in here goes, uh, there are a lot of tools I did not show. Things like making fillets or trimming lines, intersections and that kind of stuff. Just uh, don't think the only thing here are curves. There's plenty more you can do with this, either for mocking up uh, existing parts <coughs> or uh, for making, making new ones from scratch. Anyway, with that, I think we can uh, close the sketch out and turn off the image so we can see the sketch clearly. And now we gotta think about how we're gonna pad this out to make our part. So you have three different levels. Um, at uh, 5, 7, and 3.5. Um, so we could try to just, you know, take this section here, uh, extrude that at 5, this one here at 7, and this one here at 3.5, and then do a union between all three. But in my, again, limited experience, I've run into some issues uh, trying to do unions on things of coincidental faces. So like right here, where this body would touch this body, um, that would sometimes have problems uh, Uning, unioning, un, unionizing, I don't know, M merging, <laughs> because, uh, you know, if nothing else, there's, there's floating point errors in these calculations, right? Like you have two boundaries in your boundary representation of uh, these objects, and just because of rounding errors in the way numbers for computers, things won't be exactly correct, and maybe some intolerances, it'll get it right, maybe it won't. Um, so another way we can do it instead that's less prone to those kind of problems is to have them all overlap by extruding the whole thing at 3.5, extruding uh, just these two parts at five, and then extruding just this part here at seven. Uh, another option we could do is to extrude the whole thing to 3.5 and then extrude uh, just these two parts on top of that for another two to bring up to five no, extrude another 1.5 millimeters, bring it to five. I can do math. I have a math degree. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, to bring it up to five, and then to extrude just this one part on top of that, uh, another two to bring it up to seven. Um, and that would be like re-creating uh, the sketch on each face. Uh, that brings me to the next point of you know how we're going to extrude uh, this sketch three times. It's like, well, uh, 
At least as far as I know, the pad tool requires padding out the entire sketch and does not at least select individual edges. So what we're gonna do is the copy paste method of creating duplicates of the sketch. And then in each duplicate, we're going to uh, selectively enable or disable these lines as we, as we want them or not as construction geometry. Now, duplicating them is not really the best method because then if you go back and change anything, like if I wanna make this whole, um, eight millimeters rather than nine millimeters or 9.5 rather than nine, then that change does not propagate through. And I think there's something you can do with like linked copies or dependent copies, but I really don't know how that works. So if you do know, and there's a better way of doing this, I would appreciate knowing because this is, you know, not, not the easiest way to change things in the future, but at least for, for a one-off, it works well enough, right? Um, so, now we're gonna make a new body to start our extrusions. And then we're gonna duplicate this sketch. And now it goes under that new body. We're gonna turn the view of this one off. And then we're gonna edit this one. And we're gonna take this bit right here and we're gonna turn it into construction geometry, which means highlight, highlight, there we go which means it's still visible, but it doesn't become far, part of the final product. Uh, now if I close this and I try to pad it out to uh, the 3.5, it's gonna yell at me because it's a broken face. What I mean is broken face, what? We just, we just took the line out. No, 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 we took the one line out. We still have this one, right? <laughs> like I said, you can't have any intersecting lines along your outer profile. This one here is no bueno. So go back one more time, select that and then Construction geometry. Now I'm gonna close it and we go back and try to pad this guy out to 3.5. And then, ta da! Okay. Spazzy. There we go. Now we're gonna create another body. Now again, we're gonna duplicate this object. Uh, and then we're going to turn the view of this one off so you can clean, see more clearly. And this time we've already uh, extruded this tail. So we're gonna turn off this, this, and this. And then this one again. And now we can pad this out to five. Turn the view of this one back on, you can see Okay, that's looking better. And now just one more time. And then again, duplicate the image and edit it. Turn these ones off so we can see. And in case you had been watching, it's a space bar that toggles these things off and on. Uh, once again, just reminding you if you wonder what buttons I'm hitting at any point in time that is in the upper right hand corner. Oh my God. Don't mind me just getting a carpal tunnel here for YouTube fame, totally worth it. Okay, there we go. And now close it out and then pad this last one to seven. Turn on all the views. And that is not too shabby. So next up, I'm gonna take these three and then uh, do a Boolean uh, yep, combination. Wait. One sec. <laughs> Oh, right, okay, and under this workbench, the booleans are only doing, I think, uh, two at a time. Uh, when before I'd done this, I'd used it under the part workbench, I think. Hang on one sec, let me bumble through this for a moment.
kind of fuzzy on what I did when I did the other part last week. It takes a while to get these things done. Uh, let's see. And then, yeah, Boolean Union of the three. And that should give you one fused object. There we go. Now, this is a component I can export. Uh, I'm also going to save a copy of this now. And you know what? I think I'm going to try uh, demonstrating how to do the threads in here. <coughs> Just because in uh, every other video I saw about making threads in a hole, it was always centered on the origin, uh, which is a slightly easier way of doing it. And uh, I want to try and demonstrate how you would center it on a hole that is not nearby the origin. All right, so for the thread, we want to start off with the helix. Uh, from the part workbench, where we already are after we did this fusion on the three bodies. So we're going to go, uh, let's see, part, create primitive, and we're going to make a helix. Uh, we already want a one millimeter pitch, because coincidentally, the hole is going to be uh, 10 by 1, uh, a fine metric thread. The height will make that 9, so you can have a little bit above and below the part here. Uh, and the radius doesn't uh, matter uh, in our case because we're using this as a thing we're sweeping around. Um, you'll see that in a little bit. We can just create this now and it places it very unhelpfully in the middle of uh, you know, the space at the origin. So we're going to fix that by uh, double clicking to highlight the whole thing. And then, so you come down to the attachment option and we can tell FreeCAD to line it up so that oh, I wanted to get the top one there we go line up with the top one and we're gonna make it concentric okay now what this gives us is the helix being way too high above our part but at least in the middle of the hole. And we can fix that height placement by going to its properties and then tweaking the Z position, I guess to be negative eight, and then we'll drop down below. It's a little bit above, a little bit below, right in the middle. Now maybe this isn't the uh, best way to do this. You know, you can see how this these sort of changes are gonna be so unmaintainable that even if you like change the uh, height of this extrusion, uh, the helix will still remain centered over that hole. But if you change this height in relation to the other heights, then like the the position of this helix in relation to the whole thing is going to be different, and the length of the helix isn't going to be dependent on the height of this as well. Um, so there are ways if you go tweaking too many things, you can break the changes as I've done them. There are better ways of doing all this too. Uh, like for example, I know you can do some parametric stuff in FreeCAD by defining values in spreadsheets and then building off of those. Uh, I've never used this parametric modeling though because I do all my parametric modeling in CAD query using you know the uh, code, which is you know fully parameterized. Um, <laughs> but uh, <coughs> you know this is uh, you know just once again a one-off, nothing too complicated, just a single part doesn't need to be uh, part of larger assemblies or anything, and there's not going to be uh, many, if any, revisions ever done to in the future. So for this one run, I guess it's good enough. Uh, now that we have the helix, we need to make a uh, sketch for the thread form. So we're going to click on the helix, and then we're going to add a sketch. And by having the helix highlighted first, we can... Oh, having one edge of the helix highlighted first, we can uh, attach this to uh, the edge normal of that helix. There we go. Now, I'm, I haven't found a way to attach a sketch to an edge like this after you've made the sketch. So possibly is there in some one of the menus? I just haven't found it. Let's see this and then turn off the visibility so you can see better. Good. Okay, now we got to do a bit of thinking about how I want to place uh, our thread form. Turn off the grid snap and the auto constraints just for now. 
Here, I'm going to draw a triangle like that. And we're going to have this one be vertical. Good. And then since it's a one millimeter pitch, we want to have this length also be one millimeter. And we want to have all three be the same. They already have an equality constraint on them. Good. And now we got to think about what position it's supposed to be in. Uh, and I guess we have, see, this is normal. The edge of that, that was a one millimeter radius. Let me double check this again. Yep. So if this is in the center of our pilot hole and this is then at one millimeter, and we want the tip here to be at 10 millimeters because we're making a 10 millimeter thread. That means between this and this, we need another four. Yes, four. Okay. <laughs> Double check my math. And maybe I'm wrong, but I think it's four. Uh, if I'm wrong, we'll find out soon when things don't uh, want to work correctly together. So now I'm going to set the horizontal difference between... the origin and the tip of that. I'm going to make it the four I just said, and we're going to set the uh, vertical distance and make that zero. And I believe that should be good. Okay, so now if we go back to the part workbench and we decide to do a uh, sweep, we can sweep the sketch, select the sweep path, double clicking will highlight it all. Now this is one thing that really has gotten me a million times. When you're highlighting your sweep path, like first of the button to pick your sweep path is called sweep path. And then you're done picking your sweep path, you hit done. So then you hit done. And then immediately like, oh, I hit sweep path to sweep the path. Like, no, no, no. When you hit that again, it just brings you back to pick your sweep path and unhighlights what you've just done. Um, so just remember when you hit done here, your next thing to do is hit OK. <laughs> but not until we've made this sweep into a solid and the Frenet option, which uh, the solid means that we have, <coughs> um, you know, a solid thread that we're trying to cut out. Basically, if you didn't do that, you'd end up with a hollow triangular tube which is effectively cutting the thread and leaving the chip in the hole. So you want to have a solid, so it actually removes that, that chip area. And the Frenet does something with uh, keeping, um, keeping this part from rotating as it uh, goes around. If you don't do it, it, it buggers up. I'm not exactly sure what the specifics are, but if you don't do it, it buggers up. That I know. So, fingers crossed, this work. Oh, I did it! Yes! <laughs> You can tell I've had problems with this in the past, but I'm finally learning, uh, finally learning, you know, the consistent methods, um, even if they're a little bit laborious. So now we can bring the fusion back into view. We can hide that helix we don't need. We can hide that sketch we don't need. And now we're gonna do uh, the cut. So I like the fusion, I like the sweep, and come to Boolean cut. And there we have it. Boom. So now I'm going to uh, you know, export this as well, I think. Print both off. You know, see if the changes I made on the way I took that photo ended up uh, you know, bubbling through to having accurate dimensions. <laughs> you know, we'll find out in uh, just a little bit. Oh, and by the way, I'm just going to be slicing this in Cura the way you normally would. You know, open the OBJ file and all that jazz. Uh, I'm using 100% uh, infill, so it's reasonably strong. Uh, PETG filament and a uh, 0.38 millimeter layer height. Uh, I'm pretty new to printing PETG. I'm on my first roll right now. Um, and it did take a couple of tries to find settings that worked. And I've only figured out the, um, 
you know the high layer height setting so far so i'm not going to bother printing it on a fine layer height to get that threading in there with the printer i'm just printing the uh, threadless version for now um, with the high speed settings now if you wanted to make this uh, on a mill or something rather than a printer uh, there is now the path workbench here in freecad which i briefly mentioned at the start of the video um, i have Basically nil in experience with this though. Uh, I messed around with it one afternoon, you know, just dicking around and saying, uh, you know, what options are available in the menus. But uh, basically I, I have no right to be speaking about this at all. I will leave that to uh, Subtonic, the other YouTuber I mentioned, uh, who has written, you know, maybe about a third of this workbench. Um, so he can speak much better to it than I can. Uh, I will need to learn this at some point in the future for my CNC Plasma, but uh, for the time being, I'll, I'll leave it to the experts. So here we have the old print, the new print, and the original. And I don't know if you can tell, but I can pretty clearly see from here that the new print is much closer in size to the original. And if you put it here in the dropout, boom, that fits like a glove. Exactly what it has to be. Wow. So <laughs> it does seem the, uh, the difference was entirely the mismeasurement and misscaling error uh, back when we imported the image in FreeCAD originally when I use the grid versus the ruler for um, doing that scaling. So I guess the next steps here, um, you know, I might be able to design a few of these that have a bit more meat to them. You know, I do have to watch out for the fact the uh, cassette is right here and you gotta have room for the, um, the nut for the quick release and then the two counterboard bolts, which uh, I did indeed skip on this plastic part. I didn't do the counterboards here because a counterboard takes a second with a, you know, a drill by hand, but to do, do it in CAD with my level of skill would be a couple minutes. So for me, it makes sense to just do it by hand after the print, it's a secondary process. Um, but yeah, maybe I'll get a few more of these done and put them on the bike and put the whole bike back together and see if I can put some miles on one of them before it breaks. So I'm kind of curious at how well that would work. The uh, other YouTuber I mentioned who did print these, he went like back and forth for you know 30 seconds and it didn't break there. You know, but uh, I'm kind of wondering how, how much further could you push it before it goes and how much you have to beef it up, especially when you're using a different plastic like PETG versus the PLE he used and you know, how much of an impact does that have? But uh, anyway, that won't be done for a while, you know, probably not a couple of weeks or months because I got other shit to work on. Um, so in the meanwhile, I guess I'll edit the video and put it up on YouTube so hopefully I can start helping people out. And, uh, you know, I'll put these things on Thinkiverse too. So if anyone out there does have that aluminum uh, router mill and wants to help me out, then uh, hit me up. And uh, I guess if you are uh, on Thingiverse watching, then do be sure you check the um, YouTube description as well because I have a few more links to, uh, you know, Subtonics videos, um, the other guy at the derailleur and stuff. I'll have some more info up there. Um, and there's some other stuff in my channel that you may enjoy watching. But uh, in any case, thanks for watching this one. And uh, hope you enjoyed it.